It's case number 112431, Chad Taylor, petitioner, v. Chris Kobach, respondent. At this time, I will ask counsel to stand, state your appearances, and also announce if there are any threshold matters for the court to take up before we have oral arguments. May I please support your honor? Mr. Taylor appears in person, and with counsel Ms. Elizabeth Herbert and Pedro Rigonigarai, we are ready to proceed. Thank you. Your honor, Eddie Grine, and along with Tom Knudson and Brad Schlossman, will be responding to the Secretary of State. Thank you. I understand, therefore, no preliminary matters to take up? Not on behalf of the petitioner. No, your honor. Very well. Counsel, you may proceed. May it please the court. Your honor, Chief Justice, I respectfully request five minutes for rebuttal time. Five minutes is granted. Thank you, sir. The only question this court needs to decide is whether Mr. Taylor complied with KSA 25-306-BB in his signed and notarized letter, which was timely submitted to the Secretary of State's office using the language, I, Chadwick J. Taylor, Democratic nominee for the United States Senate, do hereby withdraw my nomination for election effective immediately and request my name be withdrawn from the ballot pursuant to KSA 25-306-BB. Based on the unambiguous terms of KSA 25-306-BB, Mr. Taylor's withdrawal was effective and the Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, is prohibited from printing his name on the ballot for the November 2014 election. Mr. Aragondegaray, the statute requires a declaration. It does. And the letter that you just read from it appears to me to be a request. Where does it contain any kind of declaration? The declaration, as it states in the letter, is included in the language of the statute. Pursuant to the language of the statute, that is his declaration. It is important to note that the legislature did not require the declaration to be either written or in any other form. The legislature did not require that the declaration be, that it would include any type of an explanation. And the legislature certainly in election law has on numerous other statutes set forth specific requirements for a declaration. So we suggest that by referencing the statute, pursuant to the statute, and assuming the common usage of the word, as is found in Black's dictionary, pursuant meaning by reason of something in accordance with, that he in fact did make the declaration by referencing the specific contents of the statute. Is your client's letter effective if you take off the pursuant to language? Well, I think it's pursuant to and then citing not just the statute, Justice Biles, but specifically section BB. I understand that. I'm just saying put a period before pursuant. Is the letter effective if you strike pursuant to the statute? 
I think the argument is less uh, compelling, but certainly um, the pursuant to, I believe, uh, satisfies the statutory requirements. How Let me follow up on that. Does the statute require the declaration to be made to the Secretary of State? It is our position, Your Honor, that the terms of the statutes are unambiguous and it does not require a declaration be made to the Secretary of State. And are you relying on any other form where a declaration has been made? There are numerous other, um, I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? Are you relying solely upon the letter today or are you asking us to look to any other sources for a declaration? No, we are relying strictly on the evidence before the court, which is the letter of withdrawal and the secretary's response in the letter to counsel. We believe that the statutory requirements were fully satisfied by the letter from Mr. Taylor which was notarized, timely filed, and pursuant to 25306BB. Uh, that points out a question that I had from your supplemental memorandum that you gave us yesterday at page four. You have a sentence in there that says, and I'm quoting, petitioner was plainly permitted to declare his incapability of fulfilling the duties of office if elected in any manner that he chose, period, close quote. So uh, you're not saying that he chose to make the declaration in any other venue, any other place, except in this letter. And, and that is correct. The statute doesn't require uh, any other um, declaration other than it states a declaration be made which he did complying with the statutory language. The Secretary of State argues that Mr. Taylor's withdrawal was not effective because of an alleged failure to comply with the first requirement. Specifically, he contends that the letter uh, that he used for withdrawal failed to declare that he was incapable of fulfilling the duties of office if elected. That claim is flawed for the following reasons. First, although the statute requires that a candidate declare that he or she is incapable of fulfilling the duties of office if elected, it does not dictate any particular language that must be used to follow the declaration in fact, it doesn't even require that it be in writing or submitted to the Secretary of State. As we demonstrate in our supplemental brief filed with the court yesterday, the if the legislature had wanted to require that a candidate make the declaration using any particular language or to require that the candidate submit a written declaration to the Secretary of State, it plainly knew how to do so. Those are examples, um, or excuse me, they are examples, as I mentioned, uh, in the statutes. Nevertheless, Mr. Taylor did submit the declaration in writing to the Secretary of State. He declared in no uncertain terms in his letter that he was withdrawing pursuant to 25306BB the precise subsection in which the incapability requirement appears. There's nothing else that Mr. Taylor could have meant by pursuant to, except to say that he was withdrawing because he is incapable of fulfilling the duties of the office. If well, elected. it could have been pursuant to the, the section of the statute uh, BB that requires it to be in writing. It's not very specific as to what uh, a declaration really connotes a, a proclamation, an announcement, and it's not real clear in terms of when you say pursuant to, it's a pretty broad brush that you're um, using to say that includes a pronouncement that he's incapable of serving uh, the duties of the office, isn't it? But the fact remains that he followed all of the requirements of the statute, including that it be in writing, that it be notarized, that it be presented to the Secretary of State, 
and that it be timely filed. He did not fail to satisfy, pursuant to the statute, any of the requirements, including the declaration which is mentioned in the statute. Secondly, there is no basis in law for the secretary to exercise discretion uh, to reject the letter on the basis in which he is relying. Again, had the legislature wanted to delegate that power to the Secretary of State, it could have easily done so. Perhaps foreseeing a problem like the one we're here today, it wisely chose not to. The Secretary's duty under the law is clear. He has no authority to reject Mr. Taylor's letter nor is his interpretation of the statute afforded any deference by this court, which is the ultimate arbiter of statutory text um, means. Mr. This Ronagai, um, the, uh, your opponent uh, submitted an appendix with its uh, response yesterday. Um, and in that appendix is included a letter from our Miranda Rickle. It's, uh, in fact, Your Honor, I've made a special copy of that letter okay, because great. I thought it was very instructive for the court. The does, does the secretary have discretion to accept or reject that letter? Well, the, the letter doesn't comply, according to the secretary's own words, with the specific use of the words. It doesn't reference um, any other reason than uh, this uh, person's inability to campaign, not to fulfill the duties of office. Correct, and, and, but that's really not what my question is. You were talking about the secretary's duty versus some sort of exercise of discretion. And, and that's what I was going to ask you about. This it appears to me this letter neither cites the statute nor um, recites an incapability to fulfill the duties of the office. But is it your understanding that letter was accepted by the Secretary of State? Uh, not only was it accepted, Your Honor, but I went to their website as of yesterday, and that candidate's name remains withdrawn. So it appears to me that the only difference in these two races is that the Democrat in, in, in this case, Miranda Rickle, uh, there wasn't, uh, once, once she was withdrawn, the Republican didn't have opposition. And what's also interesting about this letter is that if you'll notice in uh, Exhibit 2, Attachment C, page 12, the letter is stamped September the 3rd, 2014, the very same day that Mr. Taylor filed his letter. So, why is this letter accepted and not Mr. Taylor's when Mr. Taylor's, we suggest, fully complied with the statute's language? And that's a question I'm sure that your, your opposing counsel will address when he has an opportunity to visit with us. The question I'm trying to direct to you is that indicates that there's a belief that there's some discretion granted the Secretary of State under the statute as opposed to a clear-cut duty with no discretion possible. I, the, because the terms of the statute are unambiguous, I think it, we go down a slippery slope if we start providing uh, a great deal of discretion to the secretary in that regard. When the terms of the statute are as unambiguous as they are here, the plain meaning of the statute, I believe, should apply. And we suggest that Mr. Taylor fully complied um, with the um, uh, terms of, of the statute. But if, if we were to suggest uh, that there is some degree of discretion, it would be an abuse of discretion to have Mr. Ta Mr. Taylor's letter rejected when he substantially complied with the statutory language. But Which, so what? Go Toward that end, why does the statute use the word may? And request. It's a request made by the candidate 
requesting to have the name withdrawn. So what can we learn from the legislature's choice of the word may request? Well, I think that the may request applies to the decision of the candidate, not the Secretary of State. The candidate may request, but once that request is made, the wording on the statute is unambiguous. If the elements of the statute are complied with, as we suggest they were here, the timely fashion, uh, the declaration, uh, the notarized letter, then I suggest to you that because the statute's language is, is unambiguous, there is no discretion. Actually, the statute says may cause such person's name to be withdrawn. Yes. And the manner by which you do that is request in writing. Yes, sir. And so a person could declare that they are incapable of fulfilling the duties of office but choose not to cause their name to be withdrawn. Exactly. And my question then is, to whom is the declaration made? Well, the statute doesn't state to whom the declaration needs to be made. And, and the legislature certainly has the capacity as demonstrated in other statutes, if they chose to have uh, an indication of who was to be the recipient of the declaration to put so in writing. They chose not to. But in this case, the declaration was included in the letter to withdraw. Have we already started down that slippery slope of discretion by the case law that you cite arguing that it is a, a standard of substantial compliance? Doesn't well, that inherently have discretion if you determine substantial compliance? We did not have the benefit of knowing where the Secretary of State was going to go with his reply brief. Um, and because of the very short fuse that this case had uh, and the significant learning curve, our initial briefing was more expansive than perhaps it should have been. Because of the time and effort we've placed in this matter, we are convinced that the response to this case from the court need not be very complicated. The unambiguous language in this statute was complied by Mr. Taylor, and as a result, the secretary has a legal duty to withdraw his name from the poll. So your so main argument is full compliance? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's an alternative argument, your substantial compliance argument? Yes, ma'am. But you are still making that alternative argument? I'm not, I, I, from what you said, I question if you're withdrawing that? Or well, no, I, I, I just want to make sure that if, if the court for some reason believes that perhaps uh, full compliance to the letter of the law was not exercised, uh, certainly, w one should be able to rely on what he did do to show substantial compliance. Although our primary argument is that there was full compliance with the statutory requirement based upon the letter that he submitted. I see that I'm out of time. Well, just, just, uh, isn't this statute 306 BB designed to prevent? Uh, what we're here arguing about, and that is it takes a clear declaration of in incapacity to serve or incapable of serving office. And other than that, it's not up to a candidate once they pass the primary to change their mind or to have a change of heart. Uh, they remain on the ballot. You have to be incapable of serving or you're dead. Those are the two exceptions to get off the ballot. It isn't that, and that's what distinguishes it from pre-primary withdrawals. And I'm having trouble here seeing that, uh, based on your argument, what the distinction is between the pre-primary withdrawal and this one. If all it takes is a letter that says pursuant to this, that seems to me to defeat the purpose of the existence of the statute in the first place. Well, I, I, I respectfully would suggest to the court <coughs> that the change that the legislature enacted, I believe in 97, um, certainly included the words that the 14 words that the court has just mentioned. I would also suggest that Mr. Taylor's letter does include the declaration. What else could the words pursuant to mean? It's not as if um, it could mean anything other than 
the wording in the statute. That's a very serious declaration. Um, and because it doesn't require that the declaration be made to the Secretary of State, it doesn't require that the declaration be made to any other government um, um, functionary. It doesn't require that it be in writing. The reference to the specific wording on the statute, Your Honor, I suggest fully complies and it can be differed from pre-1997 law, where all he would have had to say was, I hear what by withdrawal. He did more than that. Pursuant to the language of the statute, clearly indicating an inability to fulfill the duties of office, that step was taken. And unless we reach a position where we state that the common meaning of the word pursuant to is going to be ignored, then I believe that full compliance occurred. Do we have any further questions? I want to move you over to your First Amendment argument to make sure I understand that. Do we need to declare the statute unconstitutional for you to prevail on your First Amendment argument? The reason I ask that is the way I read it is um, we don't want to be on the ballot with these people. And so I don't want to associate with these people. Well, the statute clearly limits a candidate's ability to get off of the ballot. So is that limitation, what you're saying, violates the First Amendment? And if so, then don't we have to strike the statute? I, again, Your Honor, um, we do not wish to go down that path because, first of all, the constitutional avoidance doctrine uh, should keep this court from having to get involved in First Amendment constitutional issues that are by far um, unnecessary for this court to reach. Uh, but clearly, um, there, there are concerns involving the uh, constitutional uh, arguments that we raised in, in our brief. Um, the um, forcing of Mr. Taylor to appear in the ballot and the constitutional arguments that would flow from that, I think are unnecessary if the court addresses the issue of full compliance as we have presented it in our case. I understand that, but what's the answer to my question if we have to get, I mean, if, if we disagree with you and so we move on, do you want us to take those arguments off the table or do we need to consider them? And if I, we need to consider them, is the statute's constitutionality in play? I, I think the statute is constitutional. It's the interpretation of the statute according to Mr. Uh, the Secretary of State that I would suggest to you brings into question constitutional issues that are not appropriate. I don't believe the statute itself is unconstitutional, but the interpretation could raise certain constitutional questions that are not necessarily in need of being addressed based upon our earlier argument. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Yes, sir. May it please the court, in 1997, at the request of the Secretary of State, the Kansas legislature added 14 words to the statute. Mr. Is that Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Graham, I want you to address the uh, exhibit and attachment, exhibit two, attachment C, page 12, that I inquired of with your opponent. It, it appears to me that, um, first of all, let's start with this. That letter has been accepted by the Secretary of State in order to keep the name of Miranda Rickle off the ballot, correct? Correct. Your, your brief said that several times, I think. Um, so doesn't that letter 
uh, the require the secretary to have exercised discretion to accept it because it doesn't cite the statute and also does not say I declare that I am incapable or, or unable to serve. It, Your Honor, I think, it's, I, th I think it makes sense to approach this entire case uh, through the lens of some of these different letters, including the Rickle letter. Okay, well, and, and I does think it require the exercise of discretion? It, it does. It, okay. it, but that, but so it, in order for you to prevail, there has to be discretion authorized in the statute. Uh, it, well, you, Your Honor, not exactly. And if I if I could have a minute to describe what the discretion is, uh, what's what's mandatory, ministerial, and what's discretionary, because this is a key point. And I think looking at these letters actually sheds light on this. So as we mentioned in our brief, uh, there obviously the statute is clear, it's unambiguous. It says that uh, you must uh, declare that you are incapable of fulfilling the duties of office. So one way, uh, that, in fact, the, the way to completely comply with the statute is to simply declare uh, in those words that you're incapable of fulfilling the duties of office. So that can be done and almost everyone else has done that. However, uh, you could also declare facts showing that you are incapable of fulfilling the duties of office. So you could actually go beyond the statute, and some people feel compelled to do this, uh, like uh, Miranda Riggle, and you could explain why you are incapable of holding she, office. She characterizes the description that she gives in her letter. I'm sure Ms. Riggle didn't expect to be in the center of this litigation today. We can all apologize to her for that. But her letter says, I have concluded it will be nearly impossible for me. And, and I'm not going to focus even on what she's saying will be nearly impossible. Your opponent mentioned it was the campaigning she was addressing rather than the fulfilling the duties of the office. But she says, nearly impossible. You, she Your does Honor, not say incapable of fulfilling the duties. You, Your Honor, but if you you have to look at the entire letter, which is what the secretary did in exercising his discretion with this letter, and you have to look at the first paragraph. In fact, you have to you have to read the whole thing. Her description. I and mean, so, so he needs to have discretion under the statute. Well, he needs to have discretion when uh, someone provides, but when someone doesn't just use the language of the statute. And where is that discretion in the statute? Where does that discretion come from? In other words, the legislature under the US Constitution controls the regulation of elections. Where did the legislature say that the secretary had discretion? Because the last sentence of the statute that we're all here today about says that no name withdrawn as provided shall be printed. That doesn't look very discretionary to well, me. Well, Your Honor, I, I, think we're, I think we're mixing and matching the wrong things here. If I could have a moment to explain. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the, uh, a statute does not have to say the words that the executive officer charged with implementing the statute has discretion. It doesn't have to do that for each part of the statute. Um, for example, uh, we, we filed a supplement uh, yesterday after we found some additional documents. And, and um, they're not terribly relevant, except there is an instructive piece here, and it's about halfway through page 10 on April 15th, 2008. What are, what are you referencing? I'm, uh, I'm referencing an attachment that we filed a supplemental affidavit yesterday, Your Honor, a, a few hours after. A supplement to this? Yes. Uh, we, we represented in our brief, Your Honor, that uh, our records only went back to 2010. Right. Everything else was in the archives. Right. Well, there were two boxes that were supposed to go to the archives and hadn't gone. So we found those, and as quickly as we could, we filed a supplement. Uh, and so I've got those. It's basically the years 2006 and 2008. Did you bring copies of that for the court today? Well, I, I have my copy here. They were they were duly filed yesterday. I didn't bring uh, bench copies or, or anything else. Okay. But I we're happy to provide those. Maybe you can just describe a little bit more thoroughly what it is. You said there were two Absolutely. boxes. What were they? What was contained in the boxes? Well, the the there were files within the boxes that are additional withdrawal letters. Okay. That are of the same type that we attached to our appendix. From what time period? Uh, this is from 2006 and 2008. Were they complete for those years? I'm sorry? Were the files that you saw yesterday complete for those years? I believe they are. I believe they are. So, Your Honor, uh, I'm 
spending a long time on this, all, all to make a possibly a minor point, but I think it's important to talk about uh, where discretion comes into play. Mm -hmm. So a candidate, uh, Peggy R. Part, uh, can't really read her handwriting, Parner, Parsons, uh, Pasner, had tried to withdraw on April 15, 2008, uh, but there had been an improper notarization. And so Brad Bryant, the elections division, wrote back, I now see it was uh, Peggy Palmer, and said uh, the notarization was not correct. So he used his discretion to examine the notarization and, uh, and decide that there was a problem. And so then it was cured, and uh, uh, Ms. Palmer was able to, to fix that. So that's, that's one area in which the, the secretary has to look. He has to at least apply the notarial law and that's, decide whether that's done. Now, that's not what we're talking about That's here. a pre-primary letter. It, it is a pre-primary right. letter. Okay. But, but it, the, the point is that discretion has to be applied every time you've got an election law and, and there are requirements. You don't have to have the words in the statute saying, we hereby confer on the secretary of state uh, the discretion to, you know, interpret this statute. It has to happen. That's how our government works. Um, so returning to the Rickle letter, uh, what, uh, what Miranda Rickle said was she had a heavier academic load than she ex expected. Um, she has to have a couple of jobs because of scholarship issues, and that will be the case this year as well. So she's talking about the period that goes into when she would be holding office. And so then she says it's all these circumstances that make it impossible for her to handle all of this. Well, our position is that the, the secretary has discretion to read an explanation like this, written by a lay person, uh, nonetheless, and decide this person is declaring. They're actually talking about the state of things. They're actually talking about facts. And they're declaring um, here the reasons why they're incapable of holding office. Now, again, that's not required. That's not required. I would say that's substantial, that's substantial compliance with this statute. So you want us to compliance? use a substantial compliance standard in looking at Mr. Taylor's letter? Well, the problem with, with <laughs> problem Mr. Taylor's letter is that... I don't care what the problem is. I want to know what the legal standard is upon which we look at that letter to see whether it complied with the law. The, the legal standard is whether Mr. Taylor either made the declaration required by, by the statute in the words of the statute, um, or he could have used impossible instead of incapable or, or something very close to it, or did he go a step further and he, did he declare the facts showing he was incapable? Where does the statute care about the facts supporting the dec this declaration that you're incapable? I don't see it because it seems like if the facts mattered, we would uh, not use an acknowledgement on the notary, we'd use an affidavit uh, well, type of standard, you know, sworn under penalty of perjury. Now, that, that's an interesting point, Justice Biles. First of all, we are not, uh, at, at no point is the secretary probing the veracity of the comments that are made. And so we're not uh, hiring a KBI to go out and see whether somebody really has an injury. Or, or to, to decide whether what they're saying is truthful. We, we just care whether they make the declaration. And again, to declare is to say something about the state of things. It's to make some factual statement. That's what declare means. And in the statute, we say, we say declares that, declares that. And then it, it mentions a specific factual condition, a, a con condition of a candidate. So that's where we get it from. Um, you know, if somebody uh, goes on and says, well, I, I'm injured, I can't travel to Topeka, I can't answer the phone, I have no energy, I can't do any work, I can't possibly, uh, you know, be representative. Let's say they use all those words, they're giving details. They are declaring they are capable of filling the duties of office. And the, that's a discretion that the secretary has. And so one interesting point flowing from that is, is mandamus really appropriate? if discretion has to be used here. Now, turning to Mr. Taylor's... But as Taylor's, I understand it, you're saying that if a candidate uses the precise 14 words, there is no discretion? Well, r correct. Correct. And, and that was... I wanted to eventually wind up at that point, uh, Justice Luker, but that is important because the candidate can avoid this whole issue by simply using the 14 words, and no one's going to quiz them about 
whether that's true or not. And why does not incorporation of the 14 words through the, the use of the phrase pursuant to the statute and the subsection accomplish that purpose of saying, I am incapable of performing the duties of office? Well, because pursuant to is not the same thing even as saying, I expressly incorporate and hereby make the declaration required by the statute. I is is there any other acceptable reason under that statute? That's particular statute that was cited. Is there any other reason other than being incapable of fulfilling the duties of office that would be acceptable? Well, Your Honor, the statute is clear. That is the only reason. That's the only reason. So when you cite it, don't you necessarily invoke that part? D no, Your Honor, that's not. The, that's the problem. Citing something is not the same thing as making a declaration. When you say pursuant to, you are saying, please accept this secretary, please accept this letter, this request from me under this statute. Well, the secretary will take the request, but he can't accept something under the statute unless someone actually makes the declaration. So when someone pleads that you accept something pursuant to or under a statute, you're simply making a plea or a legal request. You're not making a declaration. And that has to be true because otherwise, no matter what the statute says, you can always just put in there pursuant to. You can just say pursuant to every time, and those 14 words that the legislature inserted would be meaningless. It would be meaningless. And actually, in the Gannon case earlier this year, this court focused on this important canon of construction, was that, which is that we don't have surplusage. Not on pursuant to, though. Well, Gannon unsuitable. To do unsuitable. With no, the, the surplusage rule is something different entirely from whether pursuant to means I'm including what's in there or not. No, Let Your me Honor, ask I... you a different question. Where does the statute tell us that the declaration needs to appear in the writing filed as opposed to some other forum to some other person at some other time? Well, you, well actually, <laughs> that your your question may have answered itself because you know first of all the writing requirement is in the same sentence so it says a candidate who declares and then it says what they have to declare and then it says they have to file their request in writing so th this statute would make no sense it would be unenforceable well, and again but it the would plain be... language sir says the request is in writing does it not that's it doesn't right. say the declaration that's and right so when you talk about the surplusage if we determine that the declaration does not have to be in writing and does not have to be to the Secretary of State, then that does not make that section surplusage. But what it, to follow your interpretation, we have to add language. Declaration in writing to the Secretary of State. We have to add that language to get to your interpretation. Your, your Honor, I respectfully disagree. I mean, if the declaration can be made to uh, at home to, to someone's goldfish or something, then, then the statute is unenforceable. It means nothing. The, the declaration requirement is, is devoid of meaning. It must be made to the official who receives the request and processes it. Who else would it be made to? To me, that would the, the problem there would be now, now you're an making absurd another argument. You're making an argument that we should uh, interpret this uh, uh, to make it meaningful enforcement, but that's different than the plain language. The well, plain language of this can, uh, uh, does not comport with your interpretation. We have to add something to get to where you want to be. You, your Honor, I, I guess. The, the, the problem at the end of the day is the plain language uh, canon, the plain language uh, baseline for construction uh, also requires that when you read a sentence, you know, it's all in one sentence, okay, that you have, it, it ha you have to read it so that it makes sense, okay, and, and we're not even, we're not even hard, we're, we're barely using a canon of construction here. And let's say, let's say that that specific point is, is unclear, we have to at least go to the canon of Let's not read something so that it's absurd, so that someone could make a declaration to a let's, goldfish. Let's look at this. What if the legislature had intended the declaration to be to the party committee, the Democratic Party committee, that would pick a replacement? Then that makes perfect sense. Declare to the committee and then request in writing. May cause their name to be withdrawn by request in writing. Then that would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? Your Honor, I'm, actually, I'm not sure that would because 
the Secretary of State needs to know. I mean, there's a deadline that the Secretary of State has to enforce, so the Secretary would at least need to know. But, but that's not what the statute says. And, and in fact, again, this case, uh, in this case, the petitioner has admitted that it's not some other free-floating declaration, that it's this letter, that the declaration is literally the words pursuant to. So that's not the case we have here. It, it, it's, a, it's a narrow uh, question that's before this court. Let, let me ask you about the notary compliance law because that seems also to be an area that's a little loosey-goosey uh, over the years. It, start with the Miranda Rickle letter. That, there's no acknowledgement on that letter. There's a notary stamp. It doesn't even say it was signed in front of her, which is what Mr. Taylor says. And we have a statute. Uh, I think you guys cited it. You just didn't cite the, that, that part of the statute in the, uh, in the Notary Act about how an acknowledgement in an individual capacity is supposed to be formed. So it doesn't seem like we have very many acknowledgements on any of these letters that the Secretary of State has accepted. Is that, do I read that correctly, that there's a problem here? Well, it, Your Honor, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the, the words of an acknowledgment are here. And I want to go back and look myself uh, because, uh, for example, I know that someone can orally tell the notary, you know, this is my signature, I've signed it, even if they don't do it in the notary's <laughs> presence. And then the notary can, can put the words in. They're not in here. I, I agree with that. So the Rickle letter does not have, you would agree, uh, a notary that complies with the statute that we're here to talk about. Uh, yeah, I would say, and I I could be wrong about this, Your Honor, but I I would say that this is probably lacking language that the statute requires. Although I don't trust my own knowledge of Kansas notary law to give you an answer right here. I have to admit that. I looked it up on <laughs> Sunday, which is because I, I mean, the statute talks about acknowledgement you know, for deeds, people qualified for there. So, you know, I used to do that every now and then. Um, and and I was first looking at Mr. Taylor's uh, stamp, which the Secretary of State's office is the one that did that. And all it says is that he signed it before the notary, doesn't say that it was acknowledged. Then when you yesterday filed all these letters, I started looking and, and again, it seems pretty loosey-goosey. Um, so what are we to do with that? I mean, well, it seems like the legislature has put some requirements in these statutes, and you either, you guys are deciding whether you want to comply or not um, yeah. on an ad hoc basis almost. Your Honor, I don't think that's the conclusion we can draw from this. It has um, to be from the notaries, the, because it's not consistent. Yeah, it's not even in compliance with, with state law. Your Honor, one a couple of points. First of all, we did talk about the secretary having some discretion here. But, but the other point is this. Let's go back to what we are trying to do. What, what's the point of 306BB? What's the legislative intent? It's to make sure that we don't have placeholder or dummy candidates. It's to make sure that it's a very serious act and that someone declare that they're capable of holding office. Uh, now, if there's a defect in the notarization, uh, what does that mean? Um, that does, it, does it mean that now we can't be sure that Miranda Rickle herself actually signed and turned this in? Uh, are there other circumstances that lead us to believe that that's true? Uh, is, that a, is that a key substantive part of the statute, uh, or is it not? And so, so, so he, but, but, but that's not the me, issue counsel, we have. So mm -hmm. does he have discretion to ignore the procedural requirements? Uh, he doesn't have discretion to ignore it. He does have discretion to decide whether somebody has substantially complied with it. And again, substantial compliance... That goes back to my colleague's original question. You're satisfied... Are you? Is it your argument here today that the secretary should be satisfied with substantial compliance as opposed to full compliance? The, the answer, uh, Your Honor, if substantial compliance means that somebody has complied with the substance, with the key part of this statute, uh, that the reason it's there, the legislative intent, then then yes, and that so is where discretion comes into play. Substantial compliance is our standard. Substantial compliance is the standard that should be applied by this court, as opposed to 
to the letter of full compliance? Well, it, it, again, that depends on a specific part of the law that we're talking about. He so has, I'm, I'm not. He willing... has the discretion on which parts of the law he should have to comply with. Yeah. I'm sorry. That whether what he should have to comply with. Does the secretary have the discretion to choose which parts of the law must be complied with and which can be dispensed with? Uh, he actually, the uh, the secretary only has discretion. Uh, when, when there is something substantive in a law that embodies a legislative intent, uh, he has discretion in this law, in this statute. I'll limit it to that. I can't speak to the entire election code. But he has discretion to say uh, whether someone has declared that they are incapable or not. That is the key substance of 306BB, and he has that discretion. And we have said what the standard is in our brief. The standard is, did they use the words in the statute or did they declare facts that are tantamount to uh, to the words in the statute? And apparently and, and, and he also has the discretion to ignore certain aspects of notarial uh, compliance? Uh, well, I'm there sorry. Are, there are at least four or five of the ten letters you submitted that, that lack any kind of an acknowledgement. Y Your Honor. Is, uh, is he also uh, uh, vested with discretion to ignore that aspect of the of the law. Your Honor, I guess at the end of the day, I, I have to say uh, if, if there's enough to show that this person really did sign it, uh, if that case comes up, and it seems to have come up in, in the past, the Secretary has exercised that discretion. But, that issue is not before the court, but, though, today. But there's a difference. There's a difference between a jurat, uh, they signed it in, in front of me, and an acknowledgment that I signed this document for the purposes stated therein. Significant difference. And I see a real reason why the legislature made this a, an acknowledgement. Because that acknowledgement by itself would bootstrap in, for the purposes contained therein, would have bootstrapped in the, the uh, uh, declaration, potentially, that you're talking about. So I think it's pretty critical component of the statute. But Justice Johnson, I, I agree that's an important issue, but that is not the issue before the court today. The issue is the, is the declares section. We're not talking about the... the, uh, the but Gerard. what we're talking about is what the Secretary of State can and can't do. Which parts of the statute uh, the Secretary can do whatever he wants, uh, and which parts uh, he's going to hold the candidate's feet to the fire. And, and that's pretty critical here. And you're saying that he can ignore a critical procedural aspect, uh, but uh, has discretion on the content of the letter. It, it, Justice Johnson, that's, that's not what our argument is. That's not what we're saying, uh, respectfully. I mean, it, and I, I acknowledge there are letters in here where we don't have the language of the acknowledgment. Um, and so it, it appears that, that if that language is required, the secretary uh, may have exercised discretion to allow substantial compliance uh, there. But let's look back at the declaration, which is the key point here. There is not substantial compliance because there is neither a use of the word nor any facts, nor any declaration of facts. That would, that would be the same thing. Instead, there is pursuant to, and that is simply a legal argument and a plea, that 306 BB be used here. Could I go Can back I to your goldfish argument, please? Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, the issue there was is the declaration to a small group of people or whatever is not a declaration. What if Mr. Taylor would have stood on the Capitol steps and said, I'm just about ready to take this withdrawal into the Secretary of State's office and then said the magic 14 words? Would, would your argument then be that he complied with the statute? Your Honor, our argument is that it must be in writing. The, uh, it's, it's part of a sentence that requires something be filed with the Secretary that's in writing. Uh, I, I think it's, it would just be a very odd reading of it that you could make the declaration separately and orally so that it all depended on who was there and, and who heard it. Um, it just seems to be, it's not as absurd as the goldfish uh, example, but still it would be hard, it would be hard to enforce that. Counsel, you expressed your disagreement with the adequacy of Mr. Taylor's letter, correct? Well, I mean, I, that's... That's why we're here. Right, that's right. What more should he have done here 
in order to satisfy what you believe are the requirements of the statute. You've talked about people have made factual representations in the letter and the secretary or his staff look at those representations and a determination is made whether the obligations of the statute have been met or not. We don't have any factual recitation here by Mr. Taylor, but we do have, as we know, pursuant to the statute, would it have been sufficient for your purposes if he had said, I incorporate by reference the language in the statute? Would that have got him where he wants to be? Chief Justice Nuss, I, I, that, that's, a, that's a closer question uh, than just saying pursuant to, because at least then, then he would have said he incorporates it rather than that he wants someone to act based on it. Um, and, and frankly, I'll, I'll say this, it, you know, it took overnight and a meeting with the attorney general and a, a room full of lawyers for, for people to look at this and, and think it out and say, have they complied with it? I'll do my best right this moment to answer that. And uh, I would say this, um, you say, if you say you incorporate the language, that, that the problem is the statute still requires a declaration. So the, the, the fairest thing, the, the closest thing, if you want to use this incorporation formulation is, you know, I, I incorporate and hereby make the declaration, um, you know, required uh, by the language of the statute. Um, and, and, you know, I hereby make that declaration uh, in this letter. So at that point, you are doing something like when you draft a complaint and you say, uh, count two. You know, I incorporate everything I've said above. And above, you've actually made declarations. You've actually pled things. And so now, you know, count two, every, th every factual thing you pled in count one, we just look above and there are your declarations. They're made in count two as well. So I, I've, that's, that's the best I can do if, we, if we're going to use the incorporation language. And if he had simply said, I expressly adopt the language in the statute, would that be sufficient in your view? Chief Justice Ness, I don't think that would be because, again, you, you adopt the language. I mean, literally, it's it's a statute um, that <laughs> that says what the law is. So I think we all adopt the language of the statute. We all agree with it. We all uh, believe we're acting under it. But within the statute, it requires a declaration. So again, there's no there's no declaration of fact with that particular statement. And we could we could probably go on and on. I think that the point is you've got to make a declaration. And you've got to declare a fact. That word declare is important. It doesn't just say someone who believes they are capable, form the belief, and then you go withdraw. It says you declare that you are incapable, and then you go withdraw. And that's the missing piece. Your briefs also contain an argument that if Mr. Taylor is allowed to have his name withdrawn, then the people who voted for him in the primary basically have thrown away their vote. Did I characterize that accurately? Uh, Your Honor, I guess I put it this way. I, I wouldn't say they have thrown away their vote. I would say that by, by doing it this way, uh, <laughs> by doing it this way, I would say that the petitioner has negated the results of that primary and now he's now thrown it to the Democratic uh, Party convention to make the choice instead of the voters. Regardless of the actor, their vote has been negated. Is that correct? Uh, I, I would say that that's right. And let's take us now to if Mr. Taylor's name remains on the ballot. And I know it's hard for people in this courtroom to understand that there are some voters in Kansas who are not breathlessly watching today's proceedings. <laughs> And if they see his name on the ballot, they may say, there's this guy named Chad Taylor, and for whatever reason, I'm going to cast my ballot for Mr. Taylor, whether because he's a Democrat or I like his name or whatever, and a number of people cast their votes. He has declared in his affidavit that if elected, he will not serve. So my question to you is, if we keep his name on the ballot, are we then negating the vote of those folks who might vote for him? It, Your Honor, I think this, the simple answer is that the legislature has considered these possibilities, and this statute is the balancing of those possibilities. Um, I mean, the same thing happens when someone dies, uh, like Governor Carnahan in Missouri died. 
he was elected and his wife was appointed to serve out the remainder of the term. Uh, these things do happen. And, um, you know, we don't say that every time it's unconstitutional or something because the results of the primary vote are now ineffective. Uh, that's, those are just the rules of the game to have orderly elections. All right. Thank you. I Any further one. questions? Yes, yes, I do. Have, this will be brief. Um, speaking of facts that have procedural and substantive significance, potentially, um, when was this supplemental filed yesterday? What it was, time? It was filed after 12 o'clock, and I want to say it may have been filed around 2 o'clock. Okay. And you said that additional documents were found in some boxes? That's right. Uh, I, Your Honor, I know as much as is in the affidavit that's... Uh, attached to those. But there was no effort, as far as you know, to go to the archive and actually get a complete set of what had gone before 2010? Well, actually, Your Honor, I, there may have been an effort to go to the archive. I, I can't speak to that. The problem is we were on a very compressed schedule, and uh, uh, I, I, the, if these could have been found before 12 o'clock noon, uh, they would have even been in the, in the brief. So uh, we did the best we could on the, on the Titan time frame, Your Honor. In that regard, how do we deal with our uh, admonition that there would be no extensions of time to file documents? Uh, Justice Johnson, the, uh, we, we were very aware of that. Uh, the problem is uh, we don't want to have a footnote in our brief saying we only have things going back to 2010, when in fact things that were supposed to go to the archives are, are still within the, the walls of our office. and so. The, the, the best and most open way to deal with that, we thought, was to present that to the court. The court may choose to reject it, but we at least want to say that we were honest and open with the court. Well, one quick question on another one of your arguments. You argue the doctrine of operative construction and cite to a 1999 case. How did you get to that without tripping over all of the cases since then? that first disfavored and then rejected. In fact, in Douglas versus Ad Astor, 296 Kansas at 559, we said to be crystal clear, we unequivocally declare here that the doctrine of operative construction, as described in the Court of Appeals opinion, has been abandoned, abrogated, disallowed, disapproved, ousted, overruled, and permanently relegated to the history books where it will never again affect the outcome of an appeal. <laughs> Now, would well, you say, based on that, that we could disregard your argument on operative construction? Just, Justice Johnson, no one ever likes to hear that in oral argument, but I have to agree with you. I, I just want to be clear that if Mr. Taylor's letter is found to be in compliance with the statute, the Secretary of State has no discretion. Well, that's right. I mean, it, if, if, it, if it complies with, with the letter of the statute, yeah, in, in, in a way, we're actually kind of mixing two concepts here. Um, I mean, the, the discretion describes what he does when he when he reviews the text, and a, a stand a substantial compliance and perfect compliance are standards. Um, so, I'm not sure there's a there's a causal connection there. I would just say this: he does have discretion under the first part, uh, the, the substantive part, to decide whether a declaration meets the substance of that declaration, whether there are facts and whether they're saying that they're incapable. So in some cases, not in this case, but in some cases, uh, he'll get a whole stru you know, string of facts and he'll have to make that decision. Most people don't do that. Well, there's, there, I mean, there's no dispute what the letter says. So the letter is what it is. And if as a matter of law, that letter complies with the statute, he has no discretion. Oh, th that's, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. Any further questions? Would you like 30 seconds to wrap up, or do you feel you've made your points? Uh, I think I've made my points. Thank you, Chief Justice Mills. Thank you. We reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I have heard um, argued before this court by my opponent that a declaration must be in writing. Well, this, the statute simply does not make that requirement. 
nor does it require that facts be given in support of the declaration. This case is not about what the secretary wishes or what he wants. This is about the clear, unambiguous language, the words in the statutes. And the statutes, again, do not require a disclosure of any facts to support a candidate who declares that pursuant to 25306BB, he or she is withdrawing. On that, there is no discretion on the part of the Secretary of State. The well, unambiguous language and the compliance by Mr. Taylor require, as a matter of law, this court to compel the Secretary to remove Mr. Taylor's name from the ballot. I understand your opponent, though, to be saying that it's a difference if the letter had read, I, et cetera, do hereby withdraw my nomination for a election pursuant to 25306B, rather than saying as it does, I hereby withdraw my nomination and request my name be withdrawn pursuant to the statute. Do you I, I see, see very difference? little difference. I beg your pardon, Your Honor. I see very little difference in that. I believe that clearly the words that Mr. Taylor used fully comply with the language of the statute. Moreover, going back to the comment made by uh, Chief uh, Justice Nuss, um, I, I find it somehow in, uh, in conflict with the Secretary's um, previous history of protecting the ballot box, um, uh, avoiding confusion, um, not just at the local but at the national level, and yet insisting, insisting that a candidate who is not going to accept the office, who has clearly withdrawn from the race, be included in the ballot. What could possibly be the state's compelling interest when the result would be, as Chief Justice Nuss has clearly indicated, confusion and the possibility that voters not following this case and seeing Mr. Taylor's name on that ballot are going to be persuaded that because he is on the ballot that he is running and will accept the office if elected. That unnecessary amount of confusion is contraindicated. But the bottom line is that that's not the reason why this case should be decided in favor of Mr. Chad's with, uh, Taylor's withdrawal. It is simply because he fully complied with the statute. Fully complied. If the statute had diff different words requiring a writing or a reason or that the um, candidate make the declaration before the Secretary of State, perhaps, but that's not what the statute requires. And the word pursuant to the statute is more than sufficient to satisfy the statutory language. So for those reasons, I respectfully request this court to grant the relief that Mr. Taylor seeks and to order the secretary to remove his name from the ballot. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you very much. We thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.